Um, okay, so you 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 press a you press just a key on, on your keyboard. It sends a single number to the uh, computer and the central processing unit. It converts this uh, ASCII code um, to some binary number, and then you use a machine language assembly language. Um, to do all the information you want, do math, do spell checking, do searches, and, and whatever. Um, then you have a memory, usually a read over. <clears throat> it's always a, a read only memory or a random access memory. And then you also have non volatile memory. Of course, when you turn your computer off, you want to have something stored so you can, you know, the brain wakes up by itself um, in non, non volatile memory. Um, then you have graphics card, which converts your information into the monitor that you can see. Okay, the pixel, pixels on the display in uh, LCD displays or, uh, or LED displays on, on your, your monitor. But in, in any computer, all the information is coded in numbers. So we're always just dealing with basically zeros and, and ones for, for everything, numbers. And then those things are translated into text, uh, symbols, images, and whatever. But it's uh, they're they're just numbers that are you know everything's represented by a number or a series of numbers. Okay, here's a, I just wanted to show you this. Here's an ASCII keyboard. It has a uh, eight bits, um, eight bit bytes. These are two four bit numbers. So since it has eight bits, it can do 256. So you need more than just, a, uh, you know, just, just a decimal numbers. A hexadecimal number has zero through 10, but it, since it has 16 um, uh, possible numbers, you need a couple letters with it. So each one of these keystrokes like this. Okay, so if you press the number six, base 10, uh, six, is, six is up here, um, it's, it's 36 hexadecimal. And what that means is it's sending um, a, a four bit byte of three and then a, a, a four bit byte of six. So it's just sending, it's just sending those, um, those, to the, those to the computer. And letter K, um, if you look up here, here's K, its number is 6B. So there's six here in, in uh, binary and then hexadecimal B. So hexadecimal B uh, here is, is basically uh, one one, but there's always a one in front of it if, if it's a hexadecimal. Okay, and then like a character plus it's 2B and it would be represented by these. Anyway, though, the whole point is, is that you, you press a key and it's just sending, it's just sending these, uh, this binary um, in, information in, in bytes to your computer. Okay, Moore's Law, uh, named after a famous uh, founder of Intel Corporation. Uh, they, they still make really uh, some of the best uh, central processors. Um, so Gordon Moore um, described this trend uh, in 1965. Okay. And okay, if you look at this map here, here's the number of transistors per die. What they mean by die is it's just a, a certain, um, you know, the die would be like the the chip that holds all the all the uh, transistors in uh, the central processing unit. So he had this data here, basically, okay, where he only had um, you only had one transistor, right? So that's one, okay. Then you had ten, then you had ten, then you had a hundred. So 1965, he found this line here on on a uh, semi log plot right this is this is the uh, this is on a log scale and this is linear so it, uh, it it's uh, it's an exponential increase so um, if you predicted what would happen in the future you'd get this line here and lo and behold up to about 
1975, you know, when they started getting, um, you know, making larger and larger computer chips, it, fe it fell on this line. Okay, so it increases exponentially with time. It doubles in roughly every two, every two years, it doubles in, in every two years. Um, I mean, not only is it, is it the, uh, the capacity that like the number of transistors per die, but it's the memory capacity that we all have now, uh, numbers of transistors, also processing speed, uh, number of pixels in the camera are, are going up ex exponentially like this. Um, so it's, we, we, we generally call this Moore's law. I think other people had found it in, I mean, it's, it's, it's found in, in other areas, areas of science, even. things like that. Uh, let's take a look at this. As I understand it, Moore's law dictates that the number of transistors on a chip will double roughly every 24 months. Now, does that mean that the speed also doubles? Theoretically. God, if you double your speed even once, I'd have an easier time staying awake while you were talking. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, let me give some examples as quickly as I can. In 1949, the ENIAC computer calculated pi to 2,037 digits in 70 hours. Now, the modern laptop can do the same thing in 3.5 seconds, 5 million times faster than this 1950 or I can calculate it another way. In 1971, the world's first microprocessor ran at 108 kilohertz. That's each transistor switching at 108,000 times per second. Today's dual core processors exceed speeds of 2.5 gigahertz, or two and a half billion operations per second, accepting the hertz measurement as a function of the performance. That seems like about twice as fast. The modern computer can do more work than the old, so it's not a straight comparison. My laptop has 6,000 times the number of transistors, so you have to divide that 1.2 millimeters by 6,000. Let me put it another way. I was afraid of this. However, it does seem to confirm Moore's law. Adam can work really fast if he's interested in something, but sometimes he moves so slow it just drives me nuts. It's funny, computers are kind of that way too. You know, I heard once that computers have some kind of built-in timer that gradually slows them down so that whenever a new model comes out, it seems really fast. Yeah, right. It sounds like an urban legend to me. You don't believe it's true? I don't know. No way to tell, really. Hmm. Well, Moore's Law, well, it's not exactly a law. I mean, not a law of nature, that is. I mean, it's not like gravity. Um, it's more of a technological trend. Gordon Moore, who was in charge of Intel in the 60s, basically said that the number of transistors created at an optimal minimum cost doubles every two years. So this is what's allowed us to go from room-sized computers that only governments and corporations can afford to little, small gadgets and computers for the masses in just four decades. Four decades sounds like a really, really long time, but it's actually not, it's very, very fast. If Moore's Law had applied to the auto industry, for example, we'd have cars that could go a million miles per hour and get 100,000 miles to the gallon. You know, a BMW would cost um, like 20, 25 cents. Sofa change. But we don't have cars like that. We don't have anything else like that because a transistor is perhaps the only thing that can be scaled down and still function at that level and thus be doubled and 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 doubled. And that's what Moore's Law comes down to is the constant doubling. Constant doubling doesn't sound like a big deal. You know, you can do it with a piece of paper, doubled it, and I double it again and doubled it again a third time, fourth. God, I could, I could do this 20 more times, easily, right? Seven, eight. Uh, I, can't, I can't do this. If I could fold this 20 times, this little wad of paper would be half the height of the Golden Gate Bridge. You know, that's a million fold increase in 20 steps. Okay, well, anyway, back to Moore's Law. Um, if each doubling step takes two years, then 20 steps takes 40 years. And lo and behold, that's exactly what we've seen with transistors. In 1965, we had 60 transistors on a chip. Today, billions. But we can't keep doubling forever. Um, in about 10 years, transistors are going to become so numerous and become so tightly packed that they just won't 
work. But 10 years is still enough time for our gizmos to get a lot smaller and a lot more powerful. So when you see somebody in 2015 using a cell phone the size of a paperclip, you can think Moore's Law. Paperclips, yeah, I'm going to lose this really quickly, like inside my ear. Okay. Okay. Um, she, she mentioned uh, something about not going up uh, uh, in, infinitely. Okay, you can, see, you can see here this plot here um, of, of the number of transistors per die up to about 2010 and a little more. But eventually, eventually we're gonna get to a handful of atoms and then physics is going to work a lot differently in the quantum realm when you have just you know, a few atoms and you won't be able to make transistors the same, the same way you do. Um, Anyway, I, here, here's a couple things. Uh, more the computing power, uh, the speed per thousand dollars. And you look down here around 1900, 19, 1910, the analytical engine, then tabulators. Um, then you had relays here in these computers and vacuum tubes starting. Uh, and then the transistor came along right about here and then computers and integrated circuits. And then you're, you're coming up, up here. And I, I, I like the scale because on, on the side, they have the brain power of a mouse, okay? Uh, they say we've reached that, uh, well, we'll re we've reached that in 2015. Okay, I'm not, I'm not sure about, about these numbers here, but anyway, the, look at the increase increases here. Um, here, here, between here and here is nine years, but between here and here is a hundred thousand times. So we're really going up quickly in computing power, basically speed. Here's another one going up here, um, 2020, depending on which trend line you take, um, we're above a mouse, um, but they put the they put the human here. But uh, you know you have to take that with a, a gr grain of salt because I mean maybe now you can get computers to to play not only chess but the game Go and beat beat humans at it. But you know there's still a way to go to um, have computers be creative. Okay. So this is just in terms of com computation, computation. But I mean, this is, a, this is a pretty straight line here when you go from basically 1940 up to, up to the present, okay? Okay, um, so we're gonna look at pulsed digital integra integrated circuits. Okay, we need, we're gonna need electronic clocks and they're gonna require pulses. Um, first of all, you're gonna require integrated circuits that create pulses for one thing. Um, take a digital watch. If you have a, if you have a digital watch, um, the, there's a crystal that vibrates at, at about a megahertz in it. And then you just keep dividing that down a whole bunch of times with, uh, with digital electronics and you get to one hertz, so then you get one click, one uh, click for every every second. But but that's that's uh, the 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 crystal quartz in a in a digital watch would have a very high frequency, and then it's it's down the the frequency is re reduced um, down down to down to seconds if you need them. And what we'll see in the experiment uh, this week how you can how you can um, decrease frequency that same way. So when you have when you have billions of transistors, um, you know five ten billion transistors in your in your iPhone, you need to synchronize things that you don't want to you want to have information um, occurring at certain times. So. You need a clock that tells you when to when all the all the chips all the chips all the gates should do something. 
Okay, and that's that's operating at, at gigahertz frequencies. Okay. Um, I have some information on on oscillators that actually gen generate generate pulses. I I left this um, I left the information in here, but I, I won't I won't talk about it today. But it's but it's it'll be in the slides. But so we want to get to flip flops. Those are the most important things in your computer: the RS flip flop, the D flip flop or D latch, which is a which is a memory, and the JK flip flop, which is interesting because it can be configured uh, to do different kinds of uh, flip flops. And then finally, we'll look at registers and counters, and a binary counter that you that, that a binary counter that you will encounter this week. Unintended. Okay, clock speed. One of the one of the first uh, computers that you could have on your desk. It operated at about five megahertz, um, and then twenty years later, a gigahertz. Now they haven't gone up that much in frequency because you're you're kind of limited. If you go such a high frequency, um, you can start producing radiation for one thing. So now most most uh, computers run at three and a half, roughly three and three and a half gigahertz, and that means it has to have a clock tick every three hundred picoseconds. Three hundred picoseconds. To get a to get a handle on this, um, a clock tick is a third of a nanosecond. Well, light only travels a foot in a nanosecond. So so this is like in one clock tick of your computer, light would only travel a few inches. So that gives you kind of a, a physical idea of what, what nanoseconds are. Okay, clock speed or clock rate, which you uh, execute, execute instructions, uh, mainly in the, in the central processing unit. And the, the clock speed and the architecture both, both tell you how fast a computer is going to be. I mean, here's an example. Here's a 16-bit computer, and here's a 32-bit. Um, well, these are processors, 16 and 32-bit processors. But one is 20 times faster than the other just because um, maybe, maybe the, the clock rate didn't go up that much but the architecture inside. So they can design the architecture that is what uh, information comes out of what, what uh, gates and where they go to other gates. Um, they're, they're very good at that. So you can go up to 64 bits. That's, that's sort of the common uh, computer now, 64-bit processor. But then you can have different cores uh, dual core, quad core, so on, which just basically puts, you know, two or four or six um, microprocessors operating basically all at the same time in, in parallel. Okay, so how do you measure computer performance? Uh, IPS or flops? IPS instructions per second or MIPS, million instructions per second. Uh, that, that's, that's, one, that's one way to, to, to measure it. Um, here's an example of a computer, an Intel i7, um, operating at three gigahertz, two billion instructions per second, two billion instructions. Um, sometimes a better better way to um, you're you're actually interested in the computing power or how fast can you uh, do word processing or spell checking or something like that. So you want to take floating numbers often, and um, so flop is a floating uh, instruction, floating point operations per second. It's a, it's a better measure of, of performance. 
Well, okay, so it, it has most, mostly to do with scientific calculations that use, use floating points. Um, here's a computer, um, three graphics cards to achieve this many 10 to the 14th operations per second. Wow, 10 to the 14th. So there's a, there's a relationship, there's a, a, a rough relationship between instructions and floating point operations, and it's something like this. Uh, 20, to, uh, 20, 20 to 40 instructions is one flop. And here's, here's a floating point. It has all these digits, and then it has an exponent, exponent. Okay, so petaflops, I think we're up to, we're up to petaflops, petaflops now. Okay, speed. You want you want to do things faster, right? When you when you put in for a Google search, you want to have uh, you want to have your answer come up in uh, you know within a second or two, right? Faster and faster. Everything needs to be faster. Not only does it have to have to be faster when you have a lot of information, like when you have um, images and images of very high resolution. That is a lot of information to process. If it's if it's moving information, it's a moving picture. Okay, let, let me turn to supercomputer architecture, which which you think about. Wow, a phone is one thing, but what about these supercomputers? Okay, well it turns out supercomputers are scalable. And essentially what they do is they take a processor, a CPU, and they use a whole lot of the ones that are available and they put them all together and make a super supercomputer. And here, here's how mo most uh, uh, supercomputers are made. You take a processor like this, you put a whole bunch of processors together on a chip that are kind of wired together then you take a whole bunch of these chips, put it on a board. Then you take this board, put a whole lot of boards in a tower. Of course, you have to water it. You have to cool it some way. Then you take a whole lot of these towers and put them all together. So to make a supercomputer, the fastest computer in the world, you'd start off with just a almost the process, same processor you'd you'd use in your uh, you know, your desktop computer, it's just, it's just a scalable. You're taking a whole lot of those and, and putting them all together. Um, so they reached one petaflop, petaflop in uh, 2008. That cost a million dollars and it used over two megawatts of power. I mean, some of that power went into pushing the electrons around with resistance and then the resistance caused heat, and then you had to have lots and lots of cooling to take that heat away so the processors wouldn't start degrading or I guess even, even burning up. Okay, so I look up the fastest uh, computer now, 2000, 2020 in, in Japan, um, 400 petaflops. Okay, and according to this, chart here i put a star up here so it's it's way it's way up here okay and according according to these people it says it's smarter than a human okay i'm not i wouldn't i wouldn't bet, i wouldn't bet on that but it can do a whole lot of instructions very quickly very quickly uh, any questions I just wanted to give you some uh, some background of architecture and you know where 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 computers are nowadays in terms of speed and so on. Uh, yeah, I have, a, I have a question. Could you uh, sort of like put that speed in perspective? 
because that you know that looks like a lot but i don't know like wow um okay so if you go back here so petaflop is a uh, 10 to the 15th flop so taking this this number here which is one, two, three, four, five, six, seven significant digits here, plus an exponent. And um, well, you're you're half an exaflop. Well, no, well, not quite. No, you're yeah, yeah. You're half an exaflop. You're 400, 400 petaflops. So you could do, I mean, all, all, all it means is you can do, you can calculate these numbers very, 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 very quickly. And, you know, it's needed in things, especially like um, predicting, predicting the uh, weather. When you, you know, the, the weather prediction depends a lot on just taking data, um, historical data, putting it all together, finding the right algorithms to say, well, this has happened in the future. What's going uh, in the past? What's going to happen in the future? And you, you have so much data that you have to be able to process. And 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 I I think that's just you know you you don't want to get an answer in a you know in a week for weather. You have to you have to get it almost you know certainly within an hour. Um, you know, airports, airplanes are going to need that. You know, ships at sea are going to need that. Where where is this hurricane going? And that's that's all being processed uh, on the fly as it goes. So they they know what the historical data is, where hurricane paths go, what the water temperature is, what the um, what air speeds are, um, th things like that. So um, I can't tell you. I mean, I think that's one thing where what it's used that it's used for. Um, I don't know of any other uh, good examples of where you need to calculate something really quick. I do know in in my field um, when you're calculating just uh, like a new topological property of of some material that. Um, you have to make a very fine scale in energy and wave vector or momentum. And you have to, you know, computers, you know, you, you don't you don't want to have to take a month to calculate some 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 new property of something. You want to be able to do it, you know, overnight or in a week at least. You want to, you don't want to take a month or, or six months. Yeah. But, the, but, that's, but that's a good question. What, what are all these, what are these supercomputers used for? Yeah. Prediction, prediction, I, I think is this one, one good thing. I, I'm, I'm not an expert in what you do with the computers as much as what, you know, what, what research goes on to, to make better better transistors and things like that, better memories. Well, everything, everything's out there on the, on the web. You know, basically all the information in the world is at your fingertips and you can, you can find something out fairly quickly and it's being done at a very rapid, uh, rapid speed. I mean, when you think about it, what, what happens when you when you type in something, you, you're Googling something? How does it find that information so quickly? Huh? I mean, you, you saw, you saw um, in, in previous lectures about the uh, these server farms where they have thousands and thousands of, uh, of hard drives containing information. And you have lots and lots of processing speed to be able to find out information from all those thousands of, uh, of disks, hard drives.
Okay, let's take a look at pulsed ICs, things that uh, things that um, produce produce pulses and use pulses. Okay, and flip flops. I'm going to skip this. There's different kinds of uh, of um, pulsers. Here's one, 74, 121. Another one, 555 chip. You can make you, this will generate a generate a pulse. And you can make this thing into an oscillator. You can generate pulses, and you can uh, adjust the frequency, and you can adjust the, uh, uh, the the dwell time, how how long the pulse is on in one period. Also called duty cycle. It's just a fairly simple, fairly simple thing here. Maybe I'll point this out at least. Okay, so so you have two times here. You have the total period, which is t, and then you have the t one, which is the time on during a period and the time off during a period. And these two things are just related to RC time constants. That you have two different time constants, um, and you can calculate them from the value of the resistors and capacitors. Quite simple, RC time constants, tau. Okay, so about 45 minutes so far. Okay, we want to do um, sequential logic with pulses. So you have a clock, tick tock, tick tock, tick tock, and you have clock rate running at a, at a gigahertz. And you can do a whole lot of things in parallel if you can get things to uh, cooperate in, in time. So flip-flops, they're used for data transfer and storage. Sometimes they're called registers. Here's, uh, here are several types. The, uh, the RS here, the D flip-flop, T flip-flop, and then the JK flip-flop, which I'll, um, which we'll look at too. They all have um, one or two inputs. Here's two inputs. Here's one input. They all have two inputs. They all have two outputs. They always have a Q and a Q bar. I mean, it's really easy to put a not after Q and you get a Q bar. So whenever, if Q is one, Q bar will be zero. So they, all, all these, all these flip-flops have two outputs, Q and Q bar. Okay, why? Why use them? They're building blocks of memory, counters, binary math. Two stable, it's a two-state device. So here's here's a an SR or RS flip-flop. And the S stands for set and the R stands for reset. Simple as that. Okay, you have two stable outputs, Q, Q bar. And so if you, if you, if you put a one on the set, you're gonna set Q equals to one. And if you put um, a one on the reset, reset, you're going to get Q equals zero. And of course, Q bar is just the opposite. Okay, so this is a basic one called set, reset, RS, usually referred to. But I found it interesting that the uh, flip-flop goes way back over, over 100 years ago. That they, they made them out of vacuum tubes. Okay, let's take a, th take a look at the RS flip-flop. Okay, so the flip-flop, um, RS flip-flop likes to have positive going pulses. Okay, so that you'll have a zero and then at some point you'll have, you'll have a positive pulse of one, whatever the voltage that is, that could be five volts, could be three and a half volts, whatever, but it'll go from zero to some voltage. 
And here's an RS flip-flop and it has two NOR gates in it, right? This is an OR. It has a curved back, a pointed front, and then a knot in front of it. So it's a NOR. So for the a, any A and B inputs of an OR gate, you get a zero, or if any, any of a, a and B are one, you get a one. And a NOR, you just, you just uh, knot the zero or you knot the one. Okay, so the interesting thing about a NOR is any one gives a zero. See if you have any one here, you're gonna get a zero. And if you have zero and zero, you're gonna get a one. Any one gives a zero, two zeros gives a one. Okay, so if you have nothing going in, you have no pulses, zero and zero, zero, no pulse here, no pulse there. Nothing changes here. If, if S is a one, if you have a pulse on one, it's gonna set Q equal to one. And if you put a pulse in on R for the reset, you get Q equals zero. So you can set it and reset it back and forth. And there's a problem if you have one and one, and, and I'll show you that in the next slide. But let's let's take a look and see how this how this thing works. Okay. Feedback wires contain constant output values. Okay, you need these feedback wires here. Okay, so we have this. Uh, these results here. We want to see how we can get these. We want to test it. So let's take a look at what happens when you have zero and zero. You have no pulses coming in, but you have a Q set. So Q is one and uh, of course Q bar is zero. Okay, so we're going to use these rules here. Okay, so if you have a one here, then this one is connected to the input of this one. And we know that for a NOR gate, any one is going to give you an a zero. So then this, this has to be zero. And if this zero comes back to here, you have two zeros. And then you use this rule here, which any two zeros gives a one. So, um, if you start it off with one and zero, you're going to keep one and zero. You're going to keep keep the thing set. Okay. If it started off with a uh, uh, with a reset, Q is zero, and nothing happens, it's going to stay that way. And you can go you can go back over the same same logic there. But let's take a look at what happens when you have uh, when you have a zero here and a one here, a set. Okay, any one gives a zero, so you're gonna have to have a zero here. And this zero is gonna go back over here. Now you have two zeros and two zeros gives a one. So, <clears throat> so you have a set condition. Q equals one is set. Because you put a, you put a, Put a one here on set. Okay, if you put a if you put a pulse here on R instead of S, then use this rule. One gives any one gives a zero, so you're going to get a zero out here. And then coming back over here, this zero goes into here. You have two zeros. This has to be a one. And this one going into here. You have two two ones going in into this. That's okay. That's a reset. Aha. Uh -huh. <clears throat> what happens if you have two ones here? Okay. Any one gives a zero, so this has to be zero. So this puts a zero into here. This has a one. This puts a zero into here. This puts a zero back to here. 
And both of these things try to be zero at the same time. And you really want to avoid that because what happens is when if the pulses are not exactly coming in at exactly the right time, it'll go into a state that's not what you want. It might go into one of these set or reset states. Anyway, so that's that's when you want to avoid putting two pulses in at the same time. This might be kind of a stupid question, but um, oh. when you're getting the input from the other's output, Mm -hmm. Earth's, um, but the other's output depends on the output of the one you're getting the input for. How exactly does that work? I'm just kind of, it's kind of breaking my brain right now. Yeah, yeah. Um, this is kind of a, t we're, we're, we're testing this. We're like in the first two, we've either started with a set or started with a, a reset. And then you haven't done anything. So we just want to see. What happens when, is it gonna stay there? That's all we've done here. We're not putting any pulses in here or any pulses in here. So all, all these two things say is that nothing's changing if you, whatever it's set to, it's, you know, if it's a memory, it's gonna have one bit of information here. And when nothing comes in, nothing happens. Okay, it, that part is that is simple. Okay, so the the right side is our is like set already, and that's why. And the yeah, input yeah. is good. Okay, I see now. Thank you. Yeah. yeah, I just I just started. What what are all the possibilities you can have? You can have, um, you know, a set, a reset, and this 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 one here. This is in the process of setting something. It doesn't matter what it was before. I mean, suppose, suppose you started with this one here. You have, you have a reset, you have a one here. And then you say, okay, now I'm gonna put a, I'm gonna put a one in here on the set. Okay, so as soon, so as, soon as you put a one here, you have this condition and then you know you have a one is going to give you a zero out. So you know it's going to turn this one off to a zero. Okay, let me say that again. So you start with this one, it's reset. Then you give it a pulse on the set and, and this, this one goes to zero. And these things provide feedback, these wires these wires provide feedback to keep it in the same condition, okay? That it doesn't flop over to something else temporarily. That, that's what these feed, feed, feedback wires do, going from the output of one to the, to the input of another. It's just, to, it's just to keep them there, okay? Okay, so. So basically these, these two are no change. You haven't done anything. They, they just keep whatever, whatever it started with because you're not putting anything in. This is going to set a new, um, it's gonna set Q equal one by putting one in here. This is gonna set Q, Q equal to zero by putting a one into the reset. I just wanted to show you that it works for all these. And, and that, that it'll stay in that position. It'll, it'll stay in that position. That's what makes a memory, okay? Um, I'm gonna skip the RS bar flip-flop, which is just use negative pulses. So some places you'll see, um, RS bar flip flops. That just means that they're using negative going pulses. That's all it means. But they they use NAND chips instead of NORs. Don't worry about that right now. Okay. Any other questions?
flip-flops form the basis of, of almost everything in your computer. Well, they're, they're made out of gates. Okay, now we wanna have these, these things be clocked. We don't wanna have them do something whenever, when it, whenever they receive a pulse. We wanna have them do something whenever this clock tells it that it's okay, because the clock is the gatekeeper, okay? often called uh, enable or clock, CK, CP, CLK, all these different things. Anyway, so here's a symbol, uh, RS flip-flop with a clock. So the clock enables the input, okay? So nothing happens unless you get a clock pulse the same time as either an R or an S. You have to have both of them changing. Okay, so here's um, here's here's a, a clocked RS chip. So here's um, here's the clock here: zero, one, zero, one, zero, one. Here's S, and here's R, and here's Q. So S and R are the inputs, Q is the output, and C is the clock. And these are, these are edge triggering. And what edge triggering means is that it's easier for a circuit to find an edge than it is to measure a constant value. Derivatives, um, in nature, we see things when they change. If they don't change, we don't pay as much attention to them. So, so here, so at this leading edge of the clock pulse, take a look at this leading edge of the clock pulse. Um, S, is, S is high, so it's gonna set Q high, okay? And then it's not gonna do anything else until the next leading edge here. And at that point, S is zero, but R is one. So it's gonna to go to reset. So then Q is gonna go down to zero. And then the next time something would, might happen is when the next rising edge happens of the clock and both S and R are zero. So the state doesn't change. It was already, S, Q is already zero, so it stays in zero. So that's that's all. Okay, I'm going to show I'm going to show you uh, something similar to that again. Skip that one. Go to the D flip flop because it's it's the basis of memory. It has one input and a clock. Okay, and here's here's one made out of NAND NAND chips, NAND gates, and these are um, these are edge triggering. Okay, so you you have, you need a D and a clock at the same time. You need a clock edge and the value D at the same time to get a change. Okay, so here's a clock pulse. Here's, pul here's the edge here. D was zero, so the Q stays at zero. Um, here's the next, nothing happens until the next edge. The next edge, D is one, so Q changes to one. Okay, then you go over here to the next edge, rising edge. We're always gonna use a rising edge. Uh, D is one, but it was already one, so it's not going to change. Over here, this one, again, D is one, but it was, Q is already one, so it's not going to change it. And then you have to go over to here where something changes. So at this edge here, D is zero, so that's when it does change. Q changes to zero. Okay. 
So we're looking at whatever D does at the rising edge of the pulse. Uh, let's take a look at this. 20. Uh, not the gated inputs, but the triple inverted inputs, that leads to the D flip-flop. And we can actually create a new circuit block for the D flip-flop, and that looks something like this. We've got a D input, and here's our, our enable input, but it's a special type of enable input that we call the clock. And it's only on the rising edge of the clock that the D value is going to get mapped over to Q. So my truth table looks something like this. I've got D, and I've got clock. And so it's only on the rising edge of the clock that the value for D is going to get mapped to Q. So if on the rising edge of the clock, edge of the clock if D is a 1, Q becomes a 1. Again, on the rising edge of the clock, if D is a 0, Q is a 1. That's incorrect. If it's not rising, so if it's falling or if it's not changing, it doesn't matter what D is. It can be a 1 or 0. Q is going to keep it. Okay. Of course, a zero should go should go here, not not a one. Its value, whatever the value it happened to be, Q is going to stay at Q. I'm going to skip this one. <clears throat> so let's go to the JK flip flop. This is the this is the last the last part. It's the most powerful because it can be configured to an RS a D, a T, the flop. So it has, it's like the RS, it has two inputs with a clock. Here's one made out of NAND gates. <clears throat> and J can look like a set and K can look like a reset. So this can be like a, an RS flip flop. So when you have J and K are both zero and the clock goes on, nothing happens. Whatever Q is set to, it stays there. When, when J is one and the clock goes up at the, lead, at the rising edge, it sets Q equal to one. If K is one, which is a reset, when the clock goes up, it sets it sets the output to zero. Q is zero. <clears throat> and the different the difference with this one is that J and K can both be one. Okay. Whereas an RS flip flop, you had to be careful that you didn't give pulses both in the R and the S at the same time. But this one, it doesn't matter. In fact, not only doesn't it matter, it gives you something called a toggle. So if both of them are one and at the leading edge of the pulse, then it changes whatever Q is to Q bar. It's called a toggle and you'll use that one this week. Okay, Q goes to Q next. This is just what I said in words here and toggle. So here, here would be the expression for it. The next Q is the, the old Qs times J or K, K bar. Okay, so take a look at this. Might be on your exam. So here's a clock. We're only looking at the leading edge now here, 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 here. Um, so if, if J is one, K is zero, it's gonna set Q, Q up to one. The next one, K is like the reset. So it's gonna change Q from zero, from one to zero. Um, here, this edge, of the, this edge of the pulse, K is still one just like it was here. So it's still going to be set at zero. <laughs> and then at this edge, both of them are on. K is one, K is one and J is one. And so it's going to be essentially a toggle. Whatever Q was before, 
which was zero, it's going to change it to, to Q bar. So from zero to one. Okay, a toggle. And here at this edge here, both J and K are one. So it's going to toggle it again, whatever it was before. It's going to knot it. So the, the one becomes a zero. Okay, so these are these are toggles here because J and K are both one. Oh, let's watch this. I'll show you a little bit of this and then you can watch the rest of it on your own if you want. Hi there, this is David Williams, and I want to talk to you today about JK flip-flops and T flip-flops. So these are new types of flip-flops, two new types of flip-flops, and they're similar to D flip-flops in that they only change, their, the output can only change at a certain point in time, and that certain point of time is either the rising edge of the clock, so when it's changing from a low to a high, if it's a if it's a rising edge triggered flip flop, or on the falling edge, if it's a falling edge triggered flip flop, that's when the clock signal goes from a high down to a low. Now we see a JK flip flop here, and we see a timing diagram for a JK flip flop. So there's my clock signal, there's my J, my K values, and here's my output. And you can see that the output only is changing on the rising edge of the clock. It didn't change here because we were in a position, and we'll see what the rules are for JK flip flops. We we're in a state here where we didn't need to change. But everywhere else, rising edge of the clock, something happens. So here's my picture of the JK flip-flop that I have taken from Wikipedia because I was too lazy to make my own image. And what we want to know right now are what are the rules for a JK flip-flop. Now we know that it only rises, only changes on the rising edge of the clock. And so here's my clock signal right there. This little triangle thing designates the clock for any of any flip-flop that you see. And we've got our two inputs, J and K, controlling, controlling the time when it changes is the clock, giving me my two outputs, Q and Q bar. Q and Q bar are going to be opposites of each other. And we have four different combinations that J and K can be, 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, and 1, 1. And we only care about those combinations in this particular case this is the rising edge triggered clock. We only care about those values when the clock is going from a low to a high. And if anything else is happening, if it's a falling edge or if it's not changing, then we don't care what the J and K values are. We don't care what they are. Q is going to be, it's going to stay at its Q value and Q bar will stay at its Q bar value. So let's look at these four combinations, four possible combinations when the rising, when we have a rising edge of the clock. So the clock goes from a low to a high and J and K are zero. Well, this is actually the latch state. Nothing's going to change. Q is going to be staying at Q. Q bar will stay at Q bar. What about zero, one? If J is a zero and K is a one and we have this rising edge of the clock, well, this is the reset. So Q is going to go to a zero. Q bar will go to a one. Now, if J is a 1 and K is a 0 on the rising edge of the clock, this is the set. Q will go to a 1, Q bar will go to a 0. Now, here's the interesting one. This is the JK flip-flop uh, when J is 1 and K is 1, and we have a rising edge of the clock. And so what happens in this case is we have a toggle condition. So if Q is a 1, it will become a 0, and if Q is a 0, it will become a 1. And so Q, what essentially that means is that Q becomes Q bar, and Q bar becomes Q. This is the toggle. We have a toggle occurring there. So if I was to label, I'll label all of these. Here's the latch. Here's the reset. Here's the set. And there's the toggle. So we can get this this toggle occurring, which can have some some useful applications. Okay, so you basically talk, talked about this. And later, later in his uh, um, his YouTube, he he, sh he shows this a little bit more.
Here we go. Toggle from JK Flip Flop. This is what you're going to use. Okay. In the JK Flip Flop, if you set both J and K equal to one, that is you put, you put the five volts on it, every clock pulse, it's going to have a toggle. Okay. So Q is going to go to Q bar, Q, Q bar, Q, Q bar. So at the at the rising edge, you're gonna you're gonna change the state. So here, um, B is the output and A is the input. So here's the input, here's the output. So with the rising edge of the, uh, the clock pulse, you're gonna change the state of B from zero to one. And here at this rising edge, you're gonna change it from one to zero and so on. But notice this. The free, here's the frequency here, and here's half the frequency. So for each one of these things, you're dividing the frequency by two, by two. Okay, so we're gonna use it as a binary counter here, binary counter. Okay, so here's three uh, JK flip-flops in a row. So here you have a clock pulse coming in and what comes out of A is half the frequency. What comes out of B is half the frequency of A. What comes out of C is half the frequency of B. Okay, so you go from F, F over two, F over four, F over eight uh, with, the, with these three. Okay, so we're going to look at we're going to we're going to assign um, uh, bits to these. Okay, where a is the least significant bit, a is the least significant bit, and d is the most significant bit. Okay, so if you have a number like zero one zero one, uh, a is the least significant bit here. Okay, it's kind of turned around a little bit. But the A is, is corresponds to the twos, the B's is the, so, sorry, the A's are the ones, the B's are the twos, C's are the fours, and D's are the eights. Okay. Let's watch this. Okay, so here's here's a clock, and here's here's four uh, JK flip-flops, and watch these, watch these lights down here. These, these are lamps that show when, when this Q goes high, it's a one, the ones. When this Q goes high, it's the twos. When this Q goes high, it's the fours. When this Q goes high, it's the eights. One, two, three, four, five, Six, seven, eight, nine. Okay. So this is a, it counts. It counts from one to nine. Okay, here's, here's, here's some uh, discussion about the, the lab this week. We're gonna use flip-flops, counters, and we're also gonna use a display. Design and construct a binary counter circuit using flip-flops. Okay, we're gonna start off with a square wave generator. PTL pulses. Um, here, here's uh, the 74112 flip-flop has, has, this is the chip and it has two flip-flops in it. So to get three flip-flops, you'll have to use two of the chips. Then, to be able to see this display counting, we're going to use, we're going to take this binary output out of here and use this BCD to seven segment decoder driver, which will light, uh, light this. Okay, each segment in this uh, display here, there's A, B, C, D, E, F, G, so there's seven segments in here. 
of LEDs that will light up. <clears throat> and this, this thing converts the binary to be able to drive it. That's the chip number. So you put the clock pulse in, you have you have the different um, JK flip-flops. For the display, you have to have a resistor for each of the segments in the LED. You'll have to have a current limiting resistor in each of these. So you need seven current limiting resistors. Okay, so you use JK flip-flops, you use this uh, decoder, and you use the uh, LED display. And it'll flash Z zero, one, two, three, four, and it'll flash depending on how, how fast you have your, uh, your oscillator here. Okay, that's all, that's all for today.